Hey, is this BJ? This is BJ. Hey, it's Garrett with the Smoky Mountain News. How are you today? Hey, hey, Garrett. How are you doing, man? Good. Thanks for giving me some of your time today. For sure, man. Happy to do it. Well, uh, I guess just to start, uh, I've been listening to the new album for a little while, and I've been really enjoying it. And uh, I was thinking that the common thread throughout it seems to be finding clarity amid the chaos of the modern world. Uh, that is a that is a great view of it. <laughs> uh, uh, it's uh, it, it, I guess it was more written about finding the the clarity and the chaos in my personal life. Um, but uh, looking at the times that we currently live in, it makes a lot more sense to you know apply it to to our country. Yeah. Well, when I was um, watching that new video, I mean, I, uh, what what was the thought process behind? featuring the North Wilkesboro Speedway. Um, was that kind of a representative thing about the rural South right now? Well, it was kind of just like, uh, it was almost like a, a visual personification of, of kind of where we are at the South. It's like, it's this resilient thing. Um, in Arlington, not Bullworth. Um, it's a visual representation of like, uh, So that song was written about trying to find out, a lot of the songs on this record were written about trying to figure out what was going on with the election. Like, why did so many Southern people who, like, five years ago, if you'd have asked them what they thought about Donald Trump, would have said he was a silver spoon, millionaire Yankee, you know, I hate him. And it was about trying to come to this realization of, of what what changed. Yeah. And what what changed was he gave them, hope it was a false hope you know bringing back all these jobs that have been dead for 20 plus years yeah but it's, it's kind of like that song was written about like the resilience of like we've made it this far as the southern people hard-working southern people um and about the resilience of the south um and i, I think north Wilsboro motor speedway kind of represents that um you can look at that, especially while we were there touring it, you know, and, and making the, the video. You can literally close your eyes and feel like you're there on a race day back in the early 90s. Yeah. Did you go there when you um, were younger? Yeah, as a kid. Yeah, we went and saw races there. But it was like you you could look at this thing and see how great it once was. Um, and just to kind of see what happens when you leave it to to, to sit. Um, I, I think it's. And, and and a lot of a lot of my music, I guess, covers this. Like especially in the South, uh, my solo record Rockingham, I recorded it in my hometown of Reedsville, North Carolina. Okay. And we recorded that in like the abandoned downtown, you know, where all the shops say, you know, for lease or closed. Um, I think that's it's running rampant through small town America. Um, yeah, yeah. You well, know, just kind of the abandonment of small town America. Well, I, um, I I live in Western North Carolina. I live in Waynesville, and um, you know you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, man. I, well, I've lived in Waynesville six years, and and before that, I traveled extensively through the South. And I remember, you know, especially where where you're from too, and and especially where I am as well. The uh, once those industrial jobs left, people were the everything became ghost towns. Um, we we found footing out here by using the national park as the base of all the tourism and then the craft beer industry and things like that with the revitalization of Asheville. You know, I mean, Asheville, for as much as we love it today, was kind of a ghost town 20 years ago, you know, but... Of course. It's, it's become like the quaint, kind of quirky mountain town now. But that, but like you said, that's all because of tourism and the craft beer industry. Yeah, yeah. But um, not every place has that uh, luxury of that. For sure. Like my hometown of Reedsville, from the 1940s to the 80s, we were the primary source of tobacco for most of the cigarette industry. Um, the American Tobacco Company was located in Reedsville. It, it, it employed the entire city. Like three of my four grandparents retired from the American Tobacco Company. They spent their entire lives making cigarettes. So my family was super invested in this. And then in the early 90s, with all the lawsuits against big tobacco, um, and once people started realizing the health uh the health factor, they stopped smoking and sales decreased. 
you know, it left in yeah. 1992, 1993. The American Bag Company left for Eastern. Yeah. And when you have something that the, the backbone of the financial stability of a town completely move out, whether it be tobacco, whether it be textiles, whether it be steel or coal or anything that is kind of becoming obsolete in a lot of small town Americas, yeah. it left not just hundreds, but thousands of families without jobs. Where, where I grew up so, on the on the Canadian border, uh, I grew up in a town of about 2,000 people. And at the center of town, there was a pharmaceutical industry that employed pretty much half the the community and that pulled out in the 90s and went overseas and when i go home it's a ghost town and it's sad Reedsville's bouncing back just because it's kind of on the outskirts of greensboro and so you have a lot of richer people at greensboro who want to have like country homes yeah that are you know 20 minutes from greensboro so they're moving to Reedsville. but the economy never bounced back yeah yeah. Um, like my, my dad works in Winston Salem. My mother worked in Greensboro. They didn't work in Reedsville. They didn't work in the town they lived because there was no jobs to work. Yeah. In. Well, it's almost they like a, had to dr- well, it's like a false false sense of uh, an economy because you have pe- these people buying up land, but the gap between rich and poor is just as big, if not bigger, than ever. Oh, the the the, the disparity between the richer and the poor every year grew. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I come from a a, a working middle class family. Um, you know, and my family, don't get me wrong, they worked their ass off to make sure that me and my brother knew we weren't poor, didn't yeah. think we were poor. Yeah. But as an adult, looking back, it's like, I don't understand how my parents did what they did. Yeah. Um, other than just severe sacrifice on their own end. Um, like, Riesel still hadn't bounced back, and, and pretty much my whole entire life, I've watched it just crumble. Yeah. And so, like, I've, I've been kind of surrounded by that, and touring has brought a, 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 a new kind of focus on that because we have to drive because not everywhere is a New York City or a Los yeah. Angeles or a Nashville or an Austin to get to those towns you have to drive through hundreds of those tiny towns that have literally been evacuated yeah um, you'll drive through and like I said it's closed signs and for sale signs on most of these really great what used to be bustling downtown yeah. city centers what happened with um, like you know I started running around North Carolina about 06 and seeing all the construction and how it, it you know n- 10 years ago it was in essence the poster child of the progressive new south it was a becoming a purple state and and it seemed like it was really like the beacon of like a new era of the southeast what the hell happened <laughs> um because it doesn't I seem really like it's know. that anymore um north so north carolina has always been you know, you got to think the last time it went blue before the Obama administration was 88 with Carter. Yeah. So it's always been a very hardworking middle class state. Um, don't get me wrong. You have your cultural like epicenters like your your Raleigh's, your Charlotte's, your your triads, your you know, Greensboro, Winston. Yeah. Um, you've got these kind of towns that kind of um, the economy is is, is above average. But for the most part, you have these kind of smaller towns. Um, and I don't know what makes a lot of your small town, kind of poverty-stricken, middle-class white people think that the Republican Party cares about them. Yeah, um, It baffles me. If I knew, I would do something to fix it. Um, I, I had this conversation. My family is extremely conservative. And, uh, and I'm the one, you know, kind of black sheep liberal in my family. And every time we go home, I just always ask them, like, you do know that these people hate you. Yeah. Like, you're, like, the bane of their existence. Like, why do you put so much, why do you give them power over it? And, you know, it's, you know, I have no idea what the answer is. Because I refuse to say that it's just, like, every Southerner is a racist. or Every Southerner is, you know, I refuse. Because I I know these people. I grew up with these people. I I play songs for these people every night. Like, they're good people at heart. Oh yeah. Well, um, and, and if you, and that's one of those things where when you actually sit down, whether you're a liberal, liberal or a conservative, when you sit down and actually just have basic conversations, I mean, we do as a people it, at the end of the day have way more in common than what we're told. Well, oh, that's that's what I tell everybody. I'm like, listen, man. I'm like, we'll talk college football. We'll talk NASCAR. We'll talk fried chicken. We'll talk anything you want, and we're gonna have a lot in common. It's just this is one thing we differ on, like who we voted for. Um. But this is the first election in my life. I don't know how old you are. About thirty-four. I'm thirty-three. 
Okay, so this is the first election in my life where I really watched like hate and yeah. like this venom come out of yeah. people. Like in the past, it's like, oh, you voted for Bush, fuck you, you're an idiot. Like, let's go have yeah. a beer. Yeah. Like, or oh, you voted for Obama, well, the world's gonna fucking end, you know? Yeah. You're Kenyan, and yeah. this is the first election where it's been like, like real hate, like. Like Ghostbusters two type shit yeah. running out of the sewer kind of hate. I think it comes out of desperation, you know, and desperation that, turns into anger. That's exactly what it comes from. And like that, it's funny that you use that word because that's the exact word I used in Tough Folks. Um, there's a line in Tough Folks is last November I saw firsthand what desperation makes good people do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's funny that you use that exact word because that's that's exactly what I think is. And, and it's, actually, it's not what I think, it's what I know. Like, I've talked to these people. Like, last summer, I did a tour where I played all 48 states. And I went around and I just talked to people after the show. It's like, you know, inevitably it got to politics. And it was, why did, why did you make this vote? Like, you don't seem like a hateful person or a misogynist or a racist or a bigot or anything. Like, what made you vote for that guy? And the resounding answer was, the Bush administration did nothing for my family. The Obama administration did nothing for my family. What did I have to lose? Yeah. But then it becomes a vacuum um, at that point. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things. It's like desperation pushed them to bet on a wild card. Yeah. You know, it's like they voted for the right, which is what every Southern family's taught is you're supposed to do. And it, it doesn't help lower to middle America. So they voted for left if they made the switch, and nothing happened for lower to middle America. Yeah, yeah, agreed, yeah. Are you optimistic and about the future? I have to be. I just had a kid. Yeah. Uh, I just had a daughter in April, and I have to be hopeful. I have to be, I have to at least tell myself for her that it's going to get better. Yeah. Um. I, I, I do believe in the human spirit. I do believe um, that there, there's a resilience there. That this is, I, I hope this is a hiccup that we look back in, you know, 50 years and say, what the fuck? We, we dodged a bullet on that one. I'm glad we pulled ourselves back together. Um, but it comes down to we have to have the, the conversation. We have to have a discussion and not an argument. There's a difference between a discussion well, and the an argument. Well, the respect factor. The res I mean, there's, there's one respect in a discussion. There always.